We're going to get started here in a couple of minutes. We had a, a much bigger turnout than we expected. Welcome to the third annual Pelham Bluebird Society, uh, we call it a conference or whatever. Th two years ago, this is going into our third year, we started um, and we had just a few members and now our membership has grown to over 220 people in the town of Pelham. The mission statement we have is to create a bluebird population in Pelham, create bluebird sanctuaries, and ultimately become the, the largest uh, concentration of eastern bluebirds in the state of New Hampshire. We are actually closing in on that goal. <clears throat> and um, uh, I see this is the biggest turnout we've ever had. I didn't expect it to be quite as big as this. I, I fought to, to do a bigger room. I said, maybe we get more people. And I was right. Um, but anyway, this is great. So how many people were here last year? Oh, we got a lot of new people. That's great. Well, welcome back. And welcome to all of you who uh, are coming for the first time for the uh, Bluebird uh, presentation. We got a lot of things going to happen tonight. We got some guest speakers. We're going to give you an update on what progress we've made this past year as uh, the Pelham Bluebird Society in, in, in the uh, town of Pelham. Uh, all good things. Uh, I can't tell you how, how happy I am. But before we start, <clears throat> Jim, are you back there? Can you come forward, please? Jim Greenwood. Does everybody know Jim Greenwood? <laughs> Jim, uh, Jim makes it all work behind the scenes. He's, he's one of the best people in the biggest supporter of the Eastern Bluebirds in the whole town. So for that, there's my box. I want you to hold this for a minute. Jim, we have a presentation for you. It says, the Pelham Bluebird Society in gratitude recognizes Jim Greenwood for his help and support in promoting Eastern Bluebirds within the town of Pelham in 2024. Thank you, Mr. Congratulations. Hold on a minute. Put my, my official hat on. I've been coined Mr. Bluebird here in Pelham. So, anyway, Jim, congratulations and don't go away. We have a special shirt for you. That's the last one. The last one? That's a triple X right there. <laughs> I watched him put it in all. You want to give me the two X? Yeah, I got the two X. I, yeah, I, I brought both of them right. to yeah. see which one you wanted. I lost some weight. Congratulations, Jim. Hold it up. Show him. So, part of our program tonight, we've got, you've all got tickets when you come in? Raffle tickets? Okay. Anybody not get a raffle ticket? Huh? Did anybody not get a raffle ticket? Did anybody not get a raffle ticket? Um, okay, Boy Scouts, everybody's got one? Okay, don't lose it. Who, all right. It's a free raffle. We got all kinds of things to give away tonight, but let's get on with our program first. Um, uh, I'd like to do one more honoree. Mike Gendro, can you come up here? Mike's ch chairman of the uh, um, Forestry Commission. Uh, if you'll hold that for me, I can read that. It says, uh, oh, that's the wrong one. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> that back. Ah, there it is. Put that one down. <laughs> Okay, this one here is dedicated to Mike. My mic's gone. There we go. Okay, to Mike Gendro, 
In gratitude for your support and love of Bluebirds, we thank you, Pelham Bluebird Society. Thank you. Thank you. Mike wanted to have one, and Mike, you wanted to put that up at the at the uh, Merriam Farm. Yes. Yep. Okay. So yeah. we we have a poll. We have it's coming a, in. One? No. <laughs> but the poll uh, will you pick the day, and we'll go out there. We'll create a little ceremony out of it. Sounds good. This will be in the uh, sanctuary. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, we're going to get on with our program. Honey, you want to start the... Uh... Mm -hmm. Oh, my name is Roger Montblou. I'm a 50-year resident here in the town of Pelham. I'll give you a little background. Ninth, I was on the planning... I've been on the planning board. I just uh, uh, went off the planning board after 29, almost 30 years. But in 1995, I was going to seminars to try to find out as we built this town out and we pushed the uh, wildlife out uh, into smaller spaces, uh, what the best type of development would be in order to preserve the wildlife that we have in the town. Uh, so I went to lectures, you know, from uh, reptiles and amphibians, to mammals, you name it, and I got on to birds, and I went to a lecture in Tingsboro. There was a woman there, she's passed away now, but her name was Lillian Files, and she had uh, about 85 boxes set up around the countryside. She was in her early 70s, and she rode a uh, moped around doing, uh, uh, monitoring her boxes during, you know, in the beginning of nesting season, making certain there was no nest material in there so the birds could start. And then shooing out all the uh, predator birds along the way as the uh, nesting him to the planning board. For the, for the planning board here. And then uh, the Boy Scouts, which are here tonight. Is Sanjay here? Yeah, he is. Sanjay, could you come forward? Ah, that's who was waving to me back there. Okay, back in those early days, this gentleman right here. Nice, nice to, to see, see you, you again. Yeah, nice, yeah, to, see nice you. to see you. Yeah, yeah nice to be seen. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman was working on his... Uh, 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 Eagle Scout, right? Yeah, Eagle why, don't, why don't you tell them? Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it was back in 1995. Um, I met Roger. I met Lillian. Um, we uh, decided on um, building out bluebird houses for my Eagle project. So we, um, so we sourced the material through fundraising. Um, we built 75 bluebird houses. And then uh, we uh, worked with the community, found um, good places to, to put the bluebird houses. And uh, yeah, we installed them around town. And I thought we had a pretty good hit rate. Yeah, yeah. I think it was like well over 80%. We had some nesting uh, bluebirds. So, yeah, yeah very successful Great. project. Great. And I have not seen him since he got his uh, Order of the Arrow. Is that what? Uh, Eagle, Scout. Eagle Scout. Eagle Scout uh, Award. I was there that night that he got it. I have not seen him since that night. And I heard that he was in the area. And I asked uh, the Boy Scouts if they would invite him tonight. We're, it's like a deja vu. Uh, we're doing this over again. Sure. And, at the, and all these young scouts that are here, he was a young scout their age. It was what, 20, 28 Almost, years? Yeah, about 28 years ago. Yeah. About 28 years ago, he and I did this, and we're doing it again tonight. Yeah. Yeah. And the Boy Scouts, and I'll get on to what they're merging with me to do another project here in town. And we're going to get on to that a little bit later. But anyway, Sanjay, it's yeah. good to see you again. See you yeah, too, Roger. congratulations yeah, you. on your. Yeah. So we have a little history here in Pelham. There we go. I hit it off. Uh, we have a little history here in Pelham, going all the way back to 1995, and. Uh, 
I, I haven't stopped since. Uh, I didn't get this active for quite a few years because of my other duties, the planning board and business that I was running and a multitude of other things. But anyway, uh, I ended up being Mr. Bluebird here in town. I, and I love that personality. People call me that in the restaurants and in you know, the um, uh, grocery stores and stuff. So it's pretty fun. All right, so we're going to start the presentation, and then we're going to have some guest speakers, and we're going to uh, uh, bring you up to date with projects that we got going on now that is so exciting, you won't believe it. Hey, Charity, can you start? All right, so we're starting, right? So <clears throat> if everybody looks at their monitors, all right, the Eastern Bluebirds, they're from the Thrush family relative to the uh, American Robin, but they're smaller. Medium-sized birds, 6.6 .6 inches to 8.5 inches in length. Males are bright blue, black and, and black, um, I'm sorry, head, bright blue head, back and wings. Their breast is brown or orange and have a white underbelly. Females are lighter gray, um, head and back with some blue on their wings and tails. The breast is lighter color than the males. Their song is a low-pitched warbling. Is that gentleman that was here last year that create, mimicked the bluebird? Is he here tonight? Who can, who can uh, create a warble from a bluebird? Anybody? Oh, well, he's not here tonight. Last year, we had somebody that could mimic the bluebird. Their song is a low-pitched warble with several phrases consisting of one to three short notes. They call it a soft, low-pitched to a wee, to a wee. <laughs> anyway, I can't, I can't reproduce it. <laughs> I got to take lessons. Uh, average life lifespan is six to ten years. So, <clears throat> every bluebird that's alive here today in Pelham, okay in six to 10 years will be gone from the landscape. So the only way that we can keep them going is by doing what we're doing now. Humans have to help bluebirds in their nesting because their natural um, environments are, are gone. The farms have diminished. They used to, they're, they're cavity dwellers for their nesting. So a lot of the um, fence posts, the big fat, fence posts that they made their nests in are gone. So nest boxes are, are critical for bluebirds. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, next slide. I'm just running it through a couple oh, of photographs. Oh, let me know. just give you, I'm sorry. Let me give you one little uh, tidbit. When I said the they're blue on the back of their heads, their wings, their tails. Everybody that's seen one knows that. But do you know that that's not that blue is not in the pigment of their feathers? Like a cardinal, that red, that's in the pigment of their feathers. Bluebirds, their feathers, if you could put them in a microscope, is like a sponge with all the little cutouts, little holes. The sunlight hits that and absorbs all the colors except blue, and it, it emits blue. All the rest of the colors are absorbed. If you put a bluebird in a dark room, you wouldn't see any blue. So just a little tidbit. So <clears throat> anyway, go on. So they love to come to the feeders, and they're very friendly to man. Uh, and they, they're very family-oriented. They take care of their children. They are loving family, uh, uh, you know, units. And they continue to live together for quite some time before the fledglings finally go off on their own. But basically, um, the bluebirds that are in your yard, they're territorial, they're your bluebirds. They'll be there year after year, you know, and they belong to you only. That's what we find. So these are some pictures <clears throat> of, uh, from Charity's home uh, with the uh, 
birds on the rail, feeders. Some of these have been sent to us from people from the audience. <clears throat> you want to go to the next? No, these are, I was going to say these are from my house. The ones from people are in the end. Huh? The ones from um, our members are in the end. These are all, are at the all end. mine. Oh, these are all. Okay, these are all charities' pictures. Yep. We do have some from our members here, uh, and they're going to be at the end of the slideshow. So habitat and nesting, they are found in open woodlands, farms, orchards, golf courses, and other areas with open spaces and sparse trees to perch um, and watch over their house. So they like dead limbs so they can look down and watch their house. Here's a picture of their nesting. Habitat and nesting, they're found in open, I'm sorry, I read that already. They, can, they can't excavate their own cavity, so, they, so providing houses helps them survive and thrive. House hunting occurs in the fall. That's when they fly around and they check out the houses and they put them to memory for the spring. <clears throat> Box choice and placement, it should have a one and a half inch entrance hole, ability to drain, ventilate, and open for monitoring. Fast, uh, east, facing east or south, five feet off the ground, separation between the houses is important. Place in an open area away from brushy wooded area. That's so that predators don't start to try to attack them in their boxes. You can put them right out in the open, they love it. Uh, and, and predators are not uh, prone to, uh, to go into the open areas to try to attack them. Here's a nest, nest material. <clears throat> My daughter's gonna pass that around to show you what they look like. My two daughters, there's my other one. And you can see in the picture, whoop, the nest. We have, uh, we have some actual nests here that uh, were abandoned that this is what one looks like. So <clears throat> if you haven't seen a bluebird nest, or if you have, that's exactly what they look like. They will always look like that. Anything that doesn't look like that has got to go. <laughs> you got to pull them out. <clears throat> Sometimes they'll have a little, a little downy feather in, in it. They'll pluck a feather off and throw it in occasionally. But it's mostly out of grasses and pine needles. And they weave them. Does anybody have a camera in their house? You do? Did you watch the way they build them with the weaving of the pine needles? Pretty interesting. Okay, now on that, there's a brood of baby fledglings right there. You can see they got their little uh, vests on with polka dots, uh, and they're on the uh, rail. Those are mealworms. That's their favorite is mealworms, dried mealworms. Is, they, like, they love live ones, but it's hard to get live ones. But those are dried mealworms, and that's one of their favorite sources uh, from man-fed um, source. So that's the uh, father right there, and they're all lining up because they're too, they're too young to be able to pick one up and put it in their mouth. So he's putting them in there, and then there will be a day that he won't do it anymore, and they'll be going crazy. And then they finally go, wow, they jump on it themselves, and that's how they learn to eat. Next one. Oh, okay. So, yep, I'm going to have you do that. Charity's going to explain. Oops. You get your microphone. Mine keeps going off. I was going to have Roger explain. <laughs> Jim, I think mine's dead. Okay. It should be in the battery. Yep. Here you go. No, you go ahead. Hello. Stop. Talk about how they do the dance. Huh? Talk about how they do the dance and they do the dance. No, I want you to talk. Yeah. No, I know. She's gonna. She. I want Charity to explain. All right. He wants me to stand up and explain about the nesting, um, the way that the male and female interact, and basically when a, the male 
and female are deciding on a house, they do it in the fall. And you'll see them oftentimes in the fall go, to, go back and forth to different houses. They're putting that into memory for the spring. And then in the spring when they come back, they go back to um, either the one that they nested in before, or if you have a couple different houses, they'll go into that. The female will flit in and out of the house, deciding if it's going to be the, the perfect one for them. The male will prompt the female by flapping his wings and doing a little funny dance on top of the house <laughs> until, until they decide on it. Um, when it comes time to building the nest, it's only the female that builds the nest, but everything else the bluebirds share. They both um, do the responsibilities of feeding the babies and tending to them. And when the female is nesting inside the house, he'll go and feed her as well. So she's not doing it by herself. But they do everything together except build the nest. She's the one that, um, that handles that. Explain to them about your favorite one. My favorite one. <laughs> hmm. I had a couple. They were absolutely adorable. And actually, the couple that are in the photographs are, are my, my favorite ones. And um, the female had a, a marking on the back of her head. And if I didn't go out at a certain time each day and feed them the mealworms, they would come to the window and peck on the window. And I know it wasn't just a reflection, because she would go to one, the next, the next, the next, until I put mealworms out the Cheetos that they all love to eat, and like everyone else loves to eat those little crunchy mealworms. Um, and after I fed them, she was fine and she would settle down, but she would follow me around. I could call them and they would come from the woods and come out. It was a beautiful, symbiotic, and I enjoyed her for many years, and now her, her fledglings are, are who come to my house, because once you fledge them, the ones that fledge stay around for a number of years, and you'll notice them the different markings, if you take photographs, you'll see the different markings of them, and then you'll know if it's the same female or a different female. But they're part of the family. You can open up the house and check on them. Uh, Roger will describe how to do that as we get further in the PowerPoint. But yeah. So anyway, that's my, my story about my female. And I loved her, and she was beautiful. And all the photographs are of that couple. They were my favorite. Did that one get live and This one's alive. You just keep okay, so uh, keep now, this one. Now you're at intermission. They're the same one. <laughs> no, sorry. We're going to keep going. Okay. okay. So, so how many people here have nest boxes set up at home? Oh, great. That's awesome. <clears throat> and um, have you had fledglings before? Have you yeah, watched their activities? Oh, that's great. So once you get bit by having a bluebird pair take up residence at your home, you want them there year after year. I, I've never lost the desire to have them, you know, and help them. And, and uh, there's, uh, when you set up multiple nest boxes, one of the little tips is that, uh, well, of course, with everybody that has boxes here, you probably know that you have to discourage um, you know, invasive types of birds. Uh, there's invasive birds, and then there's your, your uh, uh, native birds, and native birds like cardinals, and of course cardinals are too big for those houses, but there's a lot of native birds that, um, that uh, we don't want it to harm. But there's an English sparrow. Everybody familiar with English sparrows? Oh, okay. So here's the main predators, if you can look at the monitors. The, the one on the left, I'll get to the sparrows in a minute. The one on the left is a wren. Now, I don't, I don't know anybody that doesn't get, to get a kick out of the wrens because they're so feisty. But the problem is with wrens, if they get into a bluebird house, they will peck holes in the heads of the babies and kill them all. So... <clears throat> I discourage wren nests and wrens as vehemently as I can because I've lost a lot of them like that. I'm going to practice wren nests. That's a wren nest? That's a wren nest? Yes. Okay. She's going to show you a wren nest. 
But basically what they do is they come into the house and they fill the entire house with these fat twigs so that nobody can get in the house but them. And they'll fill it all the way to the top. So <clears throat> once they get in, if you don't rip the nest out, a bluebird will never be able to take up residency. So that's, oh, the, are those red nest uh, eggs right there? Yes. Yeah. That's what the, uh, they're a little bit on the pink side with polka dots. So. <clears throat> and then here's the house yeah. yeah. Now these are, these are the, these are the toughest ones. These are English sparrows. They're not indigenous to our country. They're not indigenous to New England or, or anything. Uh, they came from England. And the male, which is on the right, has that black swatch underneath his neck with a brown on his head and white on either side. Very easy to uh, distinguish. The female's a little more difficult. She could be, you know, uh, a, a different, a chipping sparrow or whatever, until you look at it close, until you learn birds, you know, easily pick that out. But if, you, if you're not real familiar, you won't be able to tell that she's an English sparrow. But the males are easy, easy to distinguish. They do the same thing. They, they go into the house. They'll even kill the parents. I've seen them. I've seen a, a mother bluebird sitting back like this in the house with her head completely pecked and all her babies up in the back and they've killed the babies one at a time. They, they are just really difficult to control. You gotta get rid of the English sparrows as quick as you can. And that's another predator <laughs> right there. Who has hawks? So not too much you can do about hawks and you can't they're, they're, they're um, protected and everything else. So anyway, food, bluebirds, they're insectivores. Insectivores are insect eating. That's their main course. That's what they thrive on. We feed them mealworms so that they stay through the winter. And quite frankly, <clears throat> they used to hibernate year after year after year. But now with the warmer winters, they're staying up here in New England. What really, um, what really uh, forces them to, hire, uh, to uh, fly south would be uh, not, not enough food source and extremely cold winters. If you get five or 10 days of zero, 18 degrees, whatever, and windy, you can lose 50, 60% of the bluebird population because they don't, they don't uh, migrate. Uh, they don't migrate anymore, it seems, or most of them don't migrate. But that hasn't happened in many years. I've seen it happen before, but that's quite a few years ago because our winters have gotten milder. So, um, <clears throat> so most of the food sources that they like include caterpillars, beetles, crickets, grasshoppers, spiders, and flying insects. So they're good to keep around the house to keep the insect population down. They do a great job at that. Uh, bluebirds, uh, let's see. In late fall and winter, they enjoy small tree and vine fruits, berries, including sumac. They love sumac berries. Blueberries, black cherry, mistletoe, currants, holly, dogwood, and other native plants. They'll feed off of that when, when um, the insects are gone after the frost. <clears throat> so, uh, but if you put out mealworms, um, you're going to be able to keep them sustained through the winter. <clears throat> and uh, they've got a great chance of surviving, especially when snow covers all the food sources that are remaining for them. Uh, if you put out the mealworms, they, <clears throat> they then can, you know, get nourished through the winter. And there's other things you can put out, cranberries and peanut butter and what else? You make, you make up a little mixture of different things, right? Yeah, you, you uh, warm it up. If you have dried fruit, you want 
to reconstitute. If you have dried fruit, you want to reconstitute it with um, hot water so that it's not so dried out, but they do love that mixture. Mm -hmm. So you want to help them through the winters, of course, and that way there, you know, they thrive. We don't lose part of them through the winter, and they do, you know, they, they need man's help in, in many, many ways. So, <clears throat> all right, uh, go to the next one. If you put too much food out, then you're going to have a scavenger. Yeah. <laughs> too much food sometimes. <laughs> you uh, get unwanted uh, <laughs> locals <laughs> that want to come out and feed. Yeah. As a 22-pound turkey sitting on the rail, eating the, eating the bluebird food. <clears throat> and they can eat quite a bit of it. Family time. March, which we're at that point now, early April, the mating rituals begin. So if, if some of you, has anybody here seen nesting material in some of their boxes? Some of your boxes? You have? And was it bluebird nesting materials? Yeah. yeah. So that's, uh, that worries me because it's so early in the season. So what happens is if they nest too early, you get a little warm spell in the night's are not too cold, maybe in the 40s, uh, and the days get up to 50s or early 60s, uh, and you get a lot of sunshine. The days are getting longer. They start to trigger their their uh, nesting um, instincts. So I've seen it too, a little bit here and there. Not a lot, but the chances of survival of a nesting pair right now is almost nil. First of all, they can't keep the eggs warm enough, long enough, in order to hatch. And if they do, the, it's so cold they can't keep the babies warm enough for them not to, uh, you know, uh, die from the cold from, uh, you know, being exposed. So if you get any nests right now, I would say, you know, <laughs> you don't have, they don't have much chance. But <clears throat> latter part, middle, late April, you know, you're going to get nests that they're going to be able, that they'll be able to survive it. They're getting into the warmer days near the end of April, the longer sunny days. And then you got a good chance. Um, <clears throat> bluebirds will, will make about three nestings a season. Not all of them, but generally the ones that are mature will have a, a nesting in April, again, where, June, May, May. And then again, in the end of June, beginning of July. I think we saw one in August this year, didn't we? Yeah. So, uh, and that gets late because then they get into the colder weather and the juveniles have a problem with the cold. But if you've got a, a good healthy pair of females, a um, um, nesting pair, um, you know, you can get three nestings out of them. Four to five eggs in a nesting. And that means you could fledge anywhere from 12 to 15 baby bluebirds in one season out of one nest box. So that's a pretty good average. Um, and especially we see that with mature adults that come back year after year that, um, that will do that. They're, they're in the groove. So. <clears throat> Hello? Yeah. Um, at this time of year, don't be surprised if they do start the nest. I, it's, you know, a little bit premature for them to have it built. But if they build the nest, they may disappear for a little bit of time. They know when it's time. They're just getting ready as the, as the weather gets warm. So if they build that nest and it's built, you know, completely, they may disappear for a little bit. Don't get worried. Don't take the, the nesting material out. If you see it's very much bluebird and it's that circle, that cup of pine needles, because they will come back when she's ready. The other thing is they may build a decoy nest. If you have more than one nest box, they may start like you know a scant, scant bit of those pine needles and then build the, fill ne the full nest in another box. So they, they want to try to ward off any other bluebirds or any other birds. So they may build a partial decoy nest and then use the other box. But don't be afraid if they go away. They will come back. Are they the same nest all three times? 
No, they won't. Once, once you know, um, as we go through, we'll, we'll show you about the nesting time. But in between nests, when you know that all the birds have fledged, clean everything out and get rid of the pine needles far away from the nesting uh, box so that another bird doesn't pick up the material and want to build you know, uh, their own nest in there. The slide of the, uh, the slide for the, um, the houses that are jam packed, how far down is that? Oh, uh, I don't want to skip around, but I'd like to show them that one. The jam packed slide. Oh, you want to see how big the nest is? No, that one that, to clean out the nest boxes in the spring. The one that. Oh, that's for, um, that's for the Rowan, I think. Yeah. You want to wait, or can you pull it up? I can't see it on the screen unless I exit out of this. Okay, we'll stay with it then. All right, everybody here that has nest boxes, you know that at this time of year, they have to be completely cleaned out, right? And ready for the nesting pairs. You can't have any nest material in there. You gotta, be, you gotta have them, you know, so they're available for the bluebirds. And you're gonna see a lot of activity. They're gonna be flying around and the male is gonna be trying to, you know, woo his mate, you know, into picking the box. It doesn't mean they're gonna put a nest in right away. But they're trying to pick one, and he's trying to convince her that you know this is uh, this is where uh, we want to live, and so you know, like 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 in real life, right? <laughs> so uh, keep those boxes cleaned out so that he can do his job, and she'll get you know in the mood. Oh yeah, so this, they have what they call a wing wave. So that's the male right there on top of the box. And he's doing his damnedest to turn his mate on. And uh, th that's a, a ritual to, uh, to get amorous if you're a bluebird. Yeah. And so he's taking her to dinner. <laughs> he's going, honey. <laughs> How about dinner? <laughs> so, anyway, they're, they're, these, this pair here, uh, he's doing his job, getting her, uh, you know, wanting to build a nest. And there's a grouping of uh, uh, nesting bluebirds with uh, babies that have grown. So... <clears throat> Nesting. When a house is chosen, only the female builds the nest. Did you know that? The male does not build the nest. The, the male comes in with a couple of little pine needles. And then she goes in. She goes, okay, this is the house. He steps back, and she builds the entire nest. What, how quick have we seen them? A couple, couple, couple days. Yeah, two to six days, but I've seen them do it in two, two and a half days, build a nest and get ready. So here's the, uh, is that the female? She's, she's bringing nest material in. See, they're pine needles, and uh, they're getting ready to start building that nest. Yep, landing on the box. Coming in with more materials. It's quite, it's fun to watch, actually. <laughs> yeah, he's got a little mustache up there with pine needles. So there's, there's a completed nest right there with the pine needles and the, and the, and the uh, little slivers of grass and you can see that that bluebird put four four eggs down in that nest uh, so egg laying can take five to seven days during uh, this uh, parents don't spend much time in the house usually one egg per day between four and seven eggs I've not seen seven eggs before. I've seen five. I've seen four on an average. But I've never seen six or seven. Has anybody seen more than five? You have? Yeah, we have six one year. 
Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. They, did, they didn't all um, survive, though. They were there. They were oh. Yeah. Okay, so it's survival rate is tough when you got more than four, five or four. Okay, the final egg is laid. Incubation lasts 11 to 19, 11 to 19 days. Bluebirds are friendly and don't mind if you check on their progress. I used to open the houses up when they were out feeding and look, check, and see if there's any eggs cracking open yet, you know. So they don't, they don't disappear if you open their house up and look in. She'll show you how to do it. Okay. Clover's going to show you, demonstrate the proper way to open and check them. Turn it, I gotta turn it back on. Yeah, can you hold it? Hello, hello everybody. So when there are bluebirds in the house or bluebird eggs in the house, the bluebird might be very scared if you're going near it. They won't, they won't stop you because they're like a bird um, and they won't be able to stop you, but they will be a little bit afraid. So when my sister and I were younger and we wanted to go see the bluebirds, you might see the mom and dad up in the, up in the trees, like looking at you and there have been a couple times that we have been swooped at. But if you do want to check on the bluebirds, what you want to do if you don't know the bird is in the house, or just any time, just assume the bird might be in the house, you want to can turn a little bit. You want to put your hand over the hole because if there's a bird in it, they're gonna freak out and you're gonna get pecked. So you would it would be better if your hand's there versus your face right next to the hole. So you're gonna cover it, you're gonna wait a couple seconds. If nothing happens, that means there's no bird in the house. There might just be eggs, and then you would then open it up, peek inside, don't be greedy, just look for a couple seconds, do not touch anything in the house, do not move anything around, don't try to like look and see if there's eggs, because if there's eggs, you'll be able to see them, they're not gonna be hidden. And then you're gonna close it back up and walk away, walk away. Yes, so the whole covering is to one, stop you from getting a bird in your face. Um, and then also, if there is a little fledgling, it will kind of make, if there is like a little live bird in there, it'll kind of make them stop and think. So if you open it really quickly, they might jump at you because you startled them. So covering the hole and then carefully opening, opening it up will make them, not that you want them afraid, but it'll make them a little bit afraid and they'll stay where they are and they won't jump out of the house. So then they'll be good. She's right. But when you open it up, open it very slow, open it very slowly and what they'll usually do if they're, little and they're not big enough to fly yet. Hopefully you don't want to open them when they're too advanced. But what they'll do is hunker it down. And, th and then, I mean, I've even gotten to the point where they get used to me coming to look at them. And I've, I've petted them you know, and say, hey, how are you doing this morning, you know? So, you know, and, what? and the, parents, the parents are not, you know, if you touch them, they're not going to abandon them. They're not like that. So, um, but, it, you know, you've got to get very f familiar with them before you're doing things like that. Okay, so. We, we um, are going to have sheets available for nest monitoring, and that's pretty important for us doing our count to find out how many uh, bluebirds that we're fledging during the year. So this is available on the Facebook page, and we'll have copies here tonight. But I also want to say that you can check on those birdhouses by walking up on the side and putting your hand on them. But after you see that the, the last egg has been um, uh, hatched, and after the 12th to 13th day, don't open the house up after that because they will have enough feathers on there to possibly want to fledge the nest and you don't want them to prematurely leave the nest because of the nest opening up. So right. they are friendly, but just be mindful that they need their time to grow as well. Yeah. So. If, you spoke, if you spook them prematurely and they fly out of the house uh, in, in a panic, they'll, they'll hit the ground, they'll start running around, uh, but you won't be able to put them back into the house. They just won't go back in. And at that point, they're very, very vulnerable. So you don't want them out there, you know, where predators can get them and they're, they're not grown enough to fly. So like Charity was saying, you've got to be careful at, at a certain stage not to open it and bother them that last 
four or five days before they have enough feathers to fly off on their own. So I'm, I'm also going to say, so again, when me and my siblings were younger and we knew that the birds were going to be leaving the nest soon, we wanted to be outside watching them. If you can see the birdhouse from your window, please stay inside because being outside could startle the parents and the birds and it could cause them to fall instead of flying and that would not be good. So just watch from a very safe distance, but preferably stay inside your home. Let's finish. The, let's go through the rest of the program, and then we're going to get our guest speakers up. I was going to say, this is what the pin feathers look like uh, when they're getting ready to fly. Can you have a picture of that? Yep, I just showed it. This is both the parents. They're taking turns feeding the babies. There's the mom with the baby. Um, that one's looking like it wants to fledge. And then we have the progressive slide here that shows um, as the baby's getting ready to fledge, that was the first flight. And um, they like to go into brush that's close by or low hanging uh, branches. But if they do land on the ground, the parents will still tend to them until they feed on their own. The parents will try to um, encourage them to get into some safe area where it's, you know, you got a small shrub that's got a lot of overhang they can get underneath uh, where they can get some protection. So the parents are really t tend to them, you know, very busy during that part because, because the, um, the, the baby blue, bluebirds are very vulnerable, you know. So... Uh, and you can see there's a parent right there feeding one that's on the ground that hasn't been able to fly up to the branches yet. And there's some up in the trees that they're feeding. So they'll be all over the place for a while. And if you stand outside, you can hear beep, beep, beep. You know, they're calling to the parents. So you can, find, you can spot them where, where they are, you know. Parents, parents continue to care for the fledglings several weeks after they leave the nest as they learn to catch insects on their own. They teach them about their human family too. So if you're compatible with them, if you've learned to be you know, exposed with them and you know, they come to the feeders and they're not spooked by you anymore, they'll pass that on to their fledglings. So. <clears throat> And there's a, a little juvenile right there. The father's still feeding them, and they squawk like hell. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's a point where they just go, pick one up yourself. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're all over there. You know? All right. So, go on. That's the female that was my favorite. She has yeah, the white stripe on the back of her head. Yeah. The females are a little more muted. They're not as, quite as blue. <laughs> Look at this little guy. Yeah. They're really busy when they're little like that. And there's four juveniles up on the rail learning to eat. And there's one. Now this guy, this guy, this guy went through all kinds of gyration. Feed me, feed me. He started doing... All kinds of ninja moves, and uh, and the parents let him stay there. All right, they didn't feed him. <laughs> he started getting really weird with all his wings <laughs> until he finally went over and grabbed something to eat on his own. Huh? Okay, we're up to the guest speakers. Okay, so here's the part of the evening that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Um. The Pelham Bluebird Society, as I mentioned earlier, has grown to over 220 members. A lot of you, um, how many are have joined the Bluebird Society? On the Facebook group is what he's talking uh, about. Great, we got a lot of new people in here then. But you people already have Bluebirds, so you know more, than, you know as much as I do, probably. But uh, we we'd encourage you to join us. We got some great new projects coming up, and that's why we're at this juncture of the uh, 
we're done with the slides, right? Yes. Huh? Yep. Do, do, what about the ones with the, uh, the, house. the, the house? Yeah. Yes. Is that one? Yep. If he goes to the slide instead of... Okay. Before we get into the guest speakers, one last thing, because I urge you all to clean out your houses. Here's an example right there. Do you see... Can you see it on your monitors? That's a, see the mouse on the one on the left? A mouse took up residence all winter in that bluebird house. And that's his nest materials plus all his waste in that house. So <clears throat> that was sent to us um, by Priscilla. By Priscilla. Yeah, um, she's not here right now. It's Priscilla Church. Priscilla Church. <clears throat> we had her, uh, we were hoping she was going to come tonight. She sent us those slides uh, so that we could show you the importance of opening all your houses up and checking them. No bluebird's going to try to get into that house. Um, and what they did was they emptied all the material out, they washed it with soapy water, and rinsed it all out several times to get it nice and clean. But you don't want to be using bleaches and stuff. They say 10% bleach. I've seen that in some of the online, um, you know, recommendations. Uh, personally, I, I stay away from bleach. I'll just use some liquid dish detergent, you know, in soapy water, brush it all out, you know, scrub it all out, and then rinse it off. I find that the safest uh, solution to cleaning houses. Okay, so uh, now we're going to get on to what the Bluebird, um, the Pelham Bluebird Society's goals are and, and the accomplishments in the, the past year. Uh, so let me see. Okay, yep, I'm going to get, let me just first, yeah, you know, she's keeping me on point. Uh, but one of the first things that we got was last October. Was it last October? Was it the October before? Are you talking about Miriam Barn? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Was it October before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, when Miriam Farm uh, conservation um, land was turned over to the town, uh, we worked with the... Um, Forestry Committee, yeah, the Forestry Committee, and uh, uh, off and on with the um, conservation. Yeah, conservation Commission, okay, to uh, set up Bethlehem's first bluebird, actual bluebird sanctuary. Has anybody been to the Merriam Farm Sanctuary? How many people? Great, oh, great. Anybody that hasn't gone? So that's like 49, 50 acres of land, goes all the way to Beaver Brook. And um, we set up uh, there's two alcoves as you come in from Mammoth Road, the two alcoves on the left. We set up uh, bluebird housing in each one of those alcoves. I think we're up to about 18 houses or so, right? And we still have probably another 10 houses to go. We haven't completed it yet. But we fledged 27 babies out of there last summer with our count. So that was pretty successful, and uh, from that, we've taken on more projects. So um, first I'd like to get, I'm going to get Paul, Paul Gagnon up here for a second, if you want to come up, Paul. You mean like oh, I can't yeah. sit here and talk? Yeah. 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 Uh, is that live? I don't know. Yeah, yeah live? it's live. Yeah. Okay. So I'm on, Roger? Yep, you're on. As Roger said, my name is Paul Gagnon. I've been a member of the Conservation Commission for quite some time. Roger, as you know, has been on planning for like 30 years. So we got to know each other by working on town projects. And uh, eventually I got to know he was the Mr. Bluebird. So I thought, oh, what the heck, I, that sounds nice. I'll get a few bluebirds at our house. So Charity and he came over, put a house there, put a house there, put a house there, put a house there. Okay, great. I go online, I order bluebird houses, right? Bluebird houses, they're supposed to be for bluebirds. Put up four bluebird houses. About a month later, I got three pairs of sparrows and a wren. <laughs> I'm like, Roger, these are bluebird houses. Don't the sparrows know they're in the wrong place? Roger's like, I'll fix it. I'll be right over. He comes over. You know what he brings to my house? Anybody going to guess? 
a BB gun. Here he says, open the slider, shoot at the sparrows whenever you see them on the nest. So I, I like target practice. I'm shooting at the sparrows. Yeah, didn't hit any, thankfully. Then he's telling me how to kill them. I'm like, Roger, I started this to, raise, to, you know, to help the bird population. Like The bird population in the United States is down 30% in the last 30 years. Okay? Because of what you said about bluebirds, the same thing for all species. Right. They've, they've had less habitat. Well, anyway, almost I wound up killing one. That almost led to a divorce. My wife, who happens to be on my right, is like, what are you doing? You just smashed the poor sparrow up against an oak tree and threw the carcass in the woods. I'm like, no, Roger told me i got to kill him. She's like, not in my house. All right, so I'm not going to kill him. So what am I going to do now? So sparrows would go in the nest. I would take the nest out. I'd put a plastic bag over the nest, close it down for a couple weeks, then open it back up and hope like heck I got a bluebird before the sparrow came back. First year, I wound up with one pair. They laid eggs. Unfortunately, we had a big project going on in the backyard. We scared them off the nest on a cold day. To Roger's point, the eggs got cold. We didn't get anything. OK, that year was a waste. Last year, we also got a pair. This pair, raised young and fledged, don't let Roger know, but a wren hatched young in another nest, and I like wrens. I don't want to be ejected from the Bluebird Society, but I did raise young wrens last year. They have a beautiful song. They're a songbird. And wrens and bluebirds can live side by side because they were in two adjacent nest boxes, and the bluebirds raised theirs, and the wrens raised theirs. Anyway, this year, though, I have two pairs that are coming to my four houses, so I'm still only 50%. But I have two pairs coming, and I'm helping with the profits at Beaver Valley because I'm buying like 11 pounds of these doggone mealworms. You start raising bluebirds, you better take out a loan because these doggone mealworms cost more than, than steak by the pound. This $70 for 11 pounds. Have you ever bought 11 pounds of steak for $70? That's seven bucks a pound. That's pretty good steak. <laughs> so I just bought 11 pounds of them. Anyway, I got these out there. I figured out how to feed them. I got two pairs coming, so I'm very happy. Now, what makes me even more happy is when Roger talks about Merriam Farm, because I had the pleasure of negotiating the deal on Merriam Farm with Fred Merriam, the son of the person who owned the Merriam land on Mammoth Road. This is a family that's been in town since the 1600s. So I negotiated that deal on the part of conservation with Fred Merriam. Uh, it's 45 acres. It was about $450,000. But there would have been a big development that would have gone in there because they would have connected Moon Shadow all the way out to Mammoth, and you probably would have had 20 or 30 houses. Anyway, we bought that. We did a timber harvest. We used the revenue from the timber harvest. For those of you who have been there, so we used the revenue from the timber harvest to build the parking lot. We used the revenue from the timber harvest to build a bridge across Compass Brook. We built the trail that goes down to uh, Beaver Brook. It's a beautiful trail. There's a 15-acre field there, which is not, I don't want to digress, but field habitat is one of the most rare habitats in the state of New Hampshire. This is not a mowed lawn, and it is not a hay field that gets mowed in June and in September, because when you have nesting birds, you don't want to be mowing the field. This is a field that's allowed to grow up with wildflowers, and it's only mowed once every three years. We mow a third, a third, a third. So two-thirds of it aren't being mowed, and that can seed the third that you mowed. Anyway, it's beautiful the way it works with, with Roger's bluebird uh, nests, because he picked two alcoves that are out of the way. They're not in the middle of this big 15-acre field, so the people who are attending to the bluebirds are not disturbing the wild birds in the field that are you know, maybe nesting on the ground. It's just the perfect combination of things, and I'm delighted that you are able to take advantage um, of the Merriam Farm, just find another use for that beautiful piece of property. So um, I guess with that, I'll turn it over to someone else, Roger. Yep, OK, and I'll introduce him in a second. Um, Paul is right. He, um, you know, they, that was our first um, bluebird um, sanctuary. I guess you would, you know, we set up a sanctuary for bluebirds there. It's worked out extremely well. We weren't thinking much beyond that, and then all of a sudden, it mushroomed out. Um, after that, um, 
after that, we were, we were called to go to the um, uh, celebration. Ce celebrate, yep, I couldn't think of there for a minute. Uh, Yvonne was in charge of uh, the. Um, uh, huh? Celebration. Yep, she read, I'm going to have her speak to it here in a second. Anyway, she invited us to go over and become part of the Celebration Park over at the Hobbs Community Center. They put pickleball courts in. They did extensive landscaping. And I went over there and crafted a bluebird sanctuary. Uh, and they have benches and they have observation areas and feeding areas. And uh, there's bluebirds. In, I, I was over there recently. Bluebirds are flying and landing on all the houses. So we're going to get some activity there. So why don't you explain how that all came about? Can, can I use this? Can you hear me? So just to start off, um, I've known Roger since the 1980s. And he probably doesn't know this, but I am from England. So just like the British wren, I am not indigenous to the area, Roger, so I hope you don't kick me out. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, my name is Yvonne Lagarde. I am the chairperson of the Pelham New Hampshire Council on Aging, also uh, the chairperson of the newly formed uh, Community uh, Trail Coalition Committee. So I want to just thank you for listening to me today. And I'm going to talk, I don't know a whole lot about bluebirds, so I'm going to talk about how bluebirds have created partnerships that benefit our community. Um, so I would like to talk about the remarkable partnership between the Pelham Bluebird Society, the Council on Aging, and the Community Trail Coalition. Uh, Roger asked me to speak about an hour and a half ago, so I, I had to write this speech, and I, I'm going to read some of it to you. Well, I, I didn't want you to add to Paul's euthanasia. Right? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, anyway, we're embarking on a journey that not only enriches our community, but also safeguards the natural world around us. In this rapidly developing world where urbanization threatens our natural landscapes, it's become imperative to create sanctuaries for our local wildlife. And the Pelham Bluebird Society stands as a beacon of hope, tirelessly working to provide havens for our feathered friends, particularly the eastern bluebird population here in Pelham. And Roger, I, I just really applaud you for being the father of the Bluebird Society. Um, through the installation and maintenance of nesting boxes at vital locations like the Miriam Farm Conservation Area and our Celebration Park at 8 Nashua Road uh, at Hobbs Community Center, we're not just putting up wooden structures. We're weaving a tapestry of coexistence between humans and nature ensuring that these beautiful birds have a safe place to call home. And I'd like to do a shout out to Rick Davis, who is a pickleball champion, but also a volunteer who cares for the bluebirds at the Celebration Park. Every single day, he's out there caring for them. Um, our efforts extend beyond conservation alone. The Council on Aging recognizes the profound benefits of connecting older adults with nature. We understand that nature is not just healing, it's invigorating, inspiring, and it's endlessly fascinating. And that's why we joined hands with the Pelham Bluebird Society, opening up avenues for older adults to immerse themselves in the wonders of bird watching and the tranquility of our conservation lands. Moreover, our Community Trail Coalition, which the Council on Aging sponsors, underscores our commitment to inclusivity and accessibility. By creating friendly trails in our community, we're breaking down barriers, enabling people of all ages and abilities to, part to partake in the joy of outdoor exploration. And the Bluebird Society is helping us do that. This collaboration is not merely about installing bluebird houses or repairing trails. It's about fostering a deep connection 
between generations, between humans and nature and different organizations united in a common goal. So as we gather for our trail cleanup day in April 27th, and yes, I'm promoting it, uh, we're not just tidying up a park at Pelham Veterans Memorial Park, where Roger is going to be installing bluebird houses in the field. Yep, uh, that's, that's our uh, next that is project. Our next that Yvonne has invited the Pelham Bluebird, Bluebird Society to engage in. So we're inviting you to join us on April 27th, uh, 9 to 12. Uh, we're trying to sow seeds for a brighter, more harmonious future for us. So we're, together we're creating spaces where older adults can find solace in nature, where conservation efforts flourish, and where eastern bluebirds soar freely. By supporting our partnerships between different organizations, we're investing in their present and we are investing in a legacy of compassion, stewardship, and unity. And thank you, Roger, for helping us be part of this journey. I hope we continue to work hand in hand, nurturing our community and our planet for generations to come. So thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Now, can you imagine if I gave her a day to prepare? <laughs> We've got Davy Crockett over here. <laughs> and then we have this lovely lady, you know, admiring the bluebirds in their natural habitat. <laughs> okay, so now you see we had an assignment to do in the um, uh, Miriam Farm Conservation Land, and we're just about complete. I will bring up something. Uh, there are uh, inscriptions on some of the boxes. So if you want, if anybody here wants a legacy box in the Merriam Farm, uh, we have probably half a dozen of them already, but uh, I'm not sure how many. Okay. So we have forms here. If you want to dedicate a box to be your box in the uh, Merriam Farm uh, conservation area, or and I'll bring up the rest of the areas that will be available. You can have a box with an inscription on it to a loved one, or yeah, there's all kinds of um, sayings that are going on them, uh, but mostly uh, to people that you know were nature lovers that families have put on you know um, a dedication to, and it'll stay in perpetuity in the uh, Miriam Farm Conservation Area, as well as other bluebird sanctuaries that we're developing now, which I'll bring you, make you aware of in a few minutes. So, the forms are here. Um, legacy boxes are $95. That covers everything, installation, inscription, box, pole, and the labor. I do the labor for free. So, uh, <clears throat> having said that, uh, I want to get on to uh, a project that we just, yep. So Sean Cunningham is uh, uh, the manager over at the, uh, of all the cemeteries here in Pelham. Six, if anybody doesn't know, we have six cemeteries. The largest and most developed one recently is the Gibson Cemetery. And Sean is doing an incredible job. He got a hold of me. And he said, we want to do a sanctuary here in Gibson. Uh, there was bluebird boxes there before, and the person that tended to them is now deceased. And we would like you to, you know, develop that program. So we have 21 boxes. Actually, 19 are installed. I have the other two in my car for him and I to do. We did them in the winter. We get a warm day. We go out there, bang through the frozen ground. Sean did all the bang, and I just held up the box while he Ooh. installed it. <laughs> so can you imagine pounding 19 poles into the ground to put, you know, we had to do them in different days because it was uh, tough getting through the frozen ground. But I want Sean to explain how he, this man loves bluebirds. The cemetery is full of bluebirds. We've finished the Gibson Cemetery and now we're moving 
from cemetery to cemetery to cemetery. So if you want to explain, you. Correct, I have, uh, I have it. Yep. Hi everybody, Sean Cunningham, how are you? Um, I'll be brief, Yvonne had an hour and a half. I was eating a sandwich when I was told, so. <laughs> <laughs> I heard my name and I came up, but anyways. Um, we're new to it, and like he said, we had, we had some boxes at the cemetery, and as we were doing the maintenance and mowing, we would see a lot of bluebirds flying around, and I really thought it was neat. And the, the older gentleman in town, Al Dusha, I'm sure a lot of you people know, um, they started neglecting the boxes as he took ill. In the boxes, um, other birds moved in, wrecked the boxes, the boxes rotted. And I saw an ad in the Evergreen, the Pelham Evergreen, with the Bluebird Society, so I decided to email and contact someone. And um, a few weeks later, Charity came to the cemetery and spoke with us, and we made a plan to get going. That's when I met Mr. Bluebird over here. <laughs> he came over, and we, we made a plan, and um, that's what we did. We, we started late fall, before the weather took to cold, and in the winter time when we had a couple Indian summer days, we put a few more in, and two weeks ago, we just about finished up. And every time that we did it, we found nice spots every time. It, you know, it's, it's a real nice sanctuary. It's going to be really nice, and I believe Roger is going to team up with the Boy Scouts to help take care of the uh, boxes at the cemeteries. There's a lot of boxes, there's a lot of cemeteries, so it's something that we can't do because we have to maintain the cemetery. But I do welcome anybody that wants to come over and, you know, look at them and, you know, take part in it. But I do ask if you just be careful around the gentleman mowing and weed whacking, taking care of that, you know. But um, we're going to move forward as a team. I enjoy it. Um, these guys had give me a Christmas gift, um, a bluebird house for my... Um, for my house, and we've recently put that up, and we're seeing a little activity there now. Noth nothing in the box, but we've seen the bluebirds come to the sweat and stuff. Yeah, That's good. yeah. And uh, by the way, to your point, uh, we started buying some mealworms at the cemetery, and I think that uh, we might spend the whole budget on mealworms. So, <laughs> we <laughs> so we'll go from there. But he wants to ride around shares in, in Beaver Valley. Yeah, yeah. And Mr. Mealworm over here, not Bluebird. He's got two hats. <laughs> But we're excited. I have, we're excited. I have twenty pound bags in my truck. Anybody want to buy one? <laughs> yeah, please. But we're excited to move forward and learn. I got a lot to learn, but I'm excited about it. So uh, Roger's full of knowledge, and it's it's fun to get together with him and talk. You know. So anytime you you're welcome to come over. Maybe come find me at the cemetery first, so we know it's a safe haven for everybody, even the birds. You know. But Roger, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that. Sean, I, I'm so glad you reached out to me. So, as you know, I put on the ballot, uh, we just had the town elections. Yeah. And uh, I was a write-in. Uh, I'm now the Bluebird Housing Authority. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you left the planning board. Exactly. <laughs> Conflict of interest. Yeah. Now I'm chairman of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, Bluebird party. Housing Authority for Pelham. So, <laughs> why why just be a member of a, you know a planning board when you can chair that. your own committee? You know. So. Right. <laughs> so now I'm uh, going to go turn it over here to my friend. So um, I'm just want to make sure. Yep. So Randy Randy Wojcik is uh, from the Boy Scouts. So. The, it's been alluded to that the Boy Scouts, can I have all the Scouts stand up? All right. All right. All right. Let's go here. We have another Scout leader back there. Step forward. A little, yeah, you need the applause, man. He's a Navy, retired Navy man like me. We have a lot in common. Thank you. So anyway, um, uh, Randy and I got together, uh, talked about it over the phone, and I went out to the last uh, Boy Scout meeting. That's why they're here tonight. He uh, had a project going for uh, the, the uh, uh, Boy Scouts to build bluebird boxes. 
uh, they actually were going to take over the cemetery project, uh, and they were duplicating, uh, what's his name, Dusham? Yeah, yeah, Al yeah. Dusham. Al Dusham's boxes. They were different than the ones that I put up. Uh, and the Boy Scouts were uh, building them when I went to visit them at their last meeting two weeks ago. Sounds right. Yeah, about two weeks ago. So Randy and I uh, collaborated on the next uh, uh, project that we wanted to take on in the town, and that was to do Raymond Park, where the Boy Scouts are housed over there in that building. What building they call it? Uh, we call it the Scout Lodge, but it's Raymond Park. Yep. Scout Lodge. So that's where I went that night to, to see the Boy Scouts building the boxes. I asked them all to come. They did. And I hope that, you know, this was kind of, um, you know, uh, a good uh, night of taking in information on, because you guys are building the boxes now. A week ago, um, Randy and I walked through most of Raymond Park I had a can of red spray paint, and we hit little tufts of grass here and there along the wood, woodland. Uh, he and I walked it out so that the boxes that they're building right now, we picked out the locations that would be best for bluebirds to nest in. And <clears throat> have they put them up yet? Not yet, right? Not yet. We still need to... Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Randy. Randy. Go ahead. All right, so uh, thanks for inviting us tonight. Tonight. Just making sure you guys are still awake. Uh, so we built one round of birdhouses over the winter, and we were building the second one when Roger came. Um, pointed a few things we need. Uh, the big thing we didn't have is the hole in the front to make it double wide to prevent predators from coming in. So we need to make that change and then put like a wire mesh in the bottom. So when they build the houses, it's not on the bottom, and that helps with like little parasites that may form. If it gets in the nest, it'll fall through the wire, and it won't be in the nest, and it won't latch on to the little ones. Um, so we look forward to uh, you know putting the houses we made outside because Raymond is pretty big. Uh, some of those Boy Scouts tonight were Cub Scouts when we tonight! built <laughs> <laughs> when we built the bat house that's out there. So uh, they, I mean, they like building stuff. They like having fun and doing stuff for the community and conservation. Minded stuff, so we appreciate the uh, project and the, the help you've given us. Well, there's there's no better organization for good young Americans, good patriots than the Boy Scouts, and they deserve the Scout Masters deserve a lot of credit. And Randy was friends with Sanjay back in the day, and one of the things that I put to memory was Randy said I we were shooting hoops or something, and, and Sanjay would say, hey, I got to leave, I got to go build birdhouses, <laughs> and that was with me, <laughs> so 30, 20, almost 30 years ago. So when he said that, I couldn't believe that the connection was there, and that the tradition of the Boy Scouts is continuing. Uh, when um, I'm retired now, but when I had my company in Lowell, I had about 35 employees, and whenever I got an Eagle Scout that came in to apply for a job, automatically he was hired. Do you hear that, boys? He was automatically hired, okay? I, I said, tell me about yourself during the interviews, and you know, I had one young man who was an Eagle Scout who came in with very little uh, skill set, but had the desire I had him, and it was in the automotive trade, and I had him go back to an automotive college. I asked him, I said, I will hire you, but I don't have room for, you know, you know to teach I, right now because we're so busy. But if you go back and gain some knowledge, he went back for two or three years. He came back to me and reapplied, and I hired him on the spot, and he became my best employee. So there's a lot to be said about Eagle Scouts. They're, you know, they're near and dear to my heart. So keep up the good work, boys. And we're going to work together on some bluebird houses, right? boy. Okay. Thank you very much, Randy. Thank you. Yeah, really appreciate it. So hang on now. This is the fun part, right? We got anything left? 
No, I was just going to say, does anybody have any questions that haven't been answered or? Yes, questions. Yep. I have a question. Yes, sir. Can you stand up and state your name for the record? <laughs> My name is Donald Trump. And uh, <laughs> no, uh, Dan Bracco. I don't live in this town. I'm actually a friend of Roger's. But I have a a lot of bluebirds in my yard in Westford, Massachusetts. And the question I have is there was like 15 of them floating around my birdhouse, which has now rotted and fallen down, so there's no more birdhouse. But you keep talking about pears. But yet I had about 15 around this birdhouse. I don't understand how they work in pairs, and I had so many flying around my birdhouse. You were, bl you were blessed, Danny. You're blessed. <laughs> okay. It was a good birdhouse. To... Bluebirds bring joy. Okay. That, those are most likely past fledglings that um, had fledged in the area, and they stay kind of in a group during the colder months before it's nesting season. Um, during the winter, they huddle together. They used to migrate out of the area because it was too cold, but they have evolved, and then they stay during the winter. Um, these days. So they do fly together and they flock together, but when it's nesting time, then they become very territorial. So that's not uncommon at all. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Brian, but, um, you said that we have to put the, the, house, the uh, boxes out during the fall. What else did you put them out now? Is it oh, yeah. You can put them out any time of the year. The fall is good because they're looking for their spring houses, so they'll make a mental note. But any time of year is good. It's it's. No, they will. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, they'll, they'll use them at any time of the year, and even um, they may do one nesting in a particular box, and then for the second nesting, they may nest in the tree in an empty cavity or come back to that same box but, um, or use a different box. They're, they're fickle that way. But any time of year is a good time to put up a box. They will find it. And if they don't find it during nesting season, they'll find it for the next nesting season. Just keep it clear of all other nesting products, you know, uh, twigs or anything that's not pine needles and soft grass. Just keep it cleaned out until you see bluebird nesting material. Yes. Hi, I'm John Barrowbow. Um, I bought a birdhouse over at uh, Beaver Valley. Right? Um, you've done a lot of talking about putting them up. Okay, I want to put it up, and I want to know what is the best. Um, notice that it's about my height that you're putting them in. I notice that they're on a um, basically almost a, a green fence stake, mm -hmm. a fence stake. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, um, it's it's always good. Those those stakes are how tall are the stakes? About five and a half feet. Yeah. Five and a half feet is where you want the box so that it's tall enough off the ground. Yeah. Um, well, that's just a little over my head. <laughs> yep. Uh, and and what what the the birds like to do is I'll I'll have Roger talk about the different way that you fit, you have the house's face. But um, the other thing that's important is to have it not right next to the woods and not in the middle of everything either. Have it adjacent to the woods so that there may be an overhanging branch. So as the fledglings come out, they have the underbrush uh, next to the forest to go into. But the parents can watch the house when they're out of the house for predators on the, the dead branches that, that overhang. So you want to talk about the way the house what she was describing is like an ideal location, which I'm sure you, you must have some. I'd have to look at it, and I'd be happy to go over and look for you. Okay. But the houses are approximately this high so that you can open them and look in. Okay. They'll nest. They don't need to be up high on the trees. Okay, now you can talk. He's French. She, 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 told me that, she told me this was going to happen. <laughs> so, so you, when you, where are you? Put that in. 
What you want is to be able to open the, open the nest box up to look in, you know, to monitor it. And again, um, you want it about this high off the ground. We find that the seven foot fence posts, the, there's little wings at the bottom of those poles. Once they're fully submerged by about half inch or an inch, okay, you're gonna have about five and a half feet left. So if you use one of those, then just submerge it till the wings are covered. The green fence post has holes in it. So what you want to do is just get a little drill, two uh, wood screws, you know, self-tapping wood screws. Just make sure they're not too long so they don't go in and impale the babies. You know? So, uh, and that's it, really. And, and so you want it to be able to open and look, you know. You might want to put a little soap on, along here if you want, just to keep it from being too tight, you know. And then you get a lock right here, right there. And so, so you know, they, the wind doesn't blow it open or something like that. There also may be a, a covering for that green stake that you might want to put over it. Mr. Kelly in the back had a, a problem with a raccoon. I'm going to have the girls take the microphone back to Mr. Kelly. Um, he came up with a solution to put around the green post so that you don't have a raccoon uh, climb up in and cause the demise of the babies. Yeah, I had a, a problem with a raccoon taking my first brood out of the house last year. Um, so what I did was on one of those U posts to to mount the house, I put a uh, just a bit section, a two foot section of stove pipe that I just got at Lowe's. Um, drilled a couple holes through the the, um, the sides of it and mounted it with uh, through the holes on the pole with uh, some 14 gauge fencing wire from Tractor Supply. Perfect. The last thing you want to have happen is after you raise your babies and then to have a raccoon climb up and, and cause their demise. So it's always good. Yeah. So another thing is, uh, you know the um, garage door grease? You can come up about two and a half feet, two and a half feet from the bottom, just paint it on. And that way there, you can, uh, predators won't, and the uh, garage door grease lasts a long time, doesn't melt off on a hot summer or whatever. And don't put it up too high so that the bluebirds hit it, get it, get it on their wings. But if you put it below that, a number of things happen. Ant colonies won't come up into the house, which happens. And then raccoons and things like that will slide down, chipmunks, mice, snakes, all kinds of stuff. So I use, I like to use, uh, because it's quick and easy, uh, garage door grease. It's you know, it's like little, uh, it's like Vaseline almost. Okay, so what we're going to do now is the fun part. What it, we, I, we've had our wonderful guest speakers, our Boy Scouts, who we're going to be working with. I'm very excited. My friend Sanjay came back after 29 years, 28 years. Sanjay, I'm so happy to see you again and. Uh, you bring back great memories. If you could put the slide up that's on the computer. If anyone's interested in joining the Facebook group, if you're not there yet, if you take a picture of that QR code, you'll be able to bring it up. Um, just answer the questions on there. Say that you saw us here this evening. And also the email is up there if you have any additional questions. But Well, I'm sad to say, sad to say that that concludes tonight's program. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good luck. Clean out your nest boxes.
see any of us 